Uh, let's now move on to hearing from the High Commissioner, the Honourable Barry O'Farrell AO, and our dynamic panellists. Um, but before we do so, I might just see if we can conduct a little poll. So I've got a little poll here tonight, um, just to start off the conversation. Uh, this will involve a set of questions that will appear on your screens. And we would appreciate if you could respond to those questions. So you should see four questions popping up now. I'll give everyone a couple of minutes just to respond to those. All these questions are looking at our assumptions about women in technology before we start the conversation. I hope everyone's managed to answer some of those questions. And I'm quite interested to see what people's, how people think uh, India and Australia are tracking in terms of gender equality and pay equality. Right, and we might bring up those results now. So the first question was, what is the percentage of women in technical roles in the corporate sector across India? And I'm looking forward to seeing how many, what percentage people thought that was. Although I'm, I'm not quite sure what you answered, but um, if you want the answer, it's actually 26%. There you go. So no one answered 26%. Um, and it's actually quite a mix too, isn't it? Uh, 15 and 33%. So some of you think a lot lower, some of you think a little bit higher. Um, it's good to see that there's a bit of diversity in views here. Uh, now the qu second question about how many years will it take to bridge the gender parity gap? Um, the answer is 99.5. That's quite a scary number, isn't it? Um, but a lot of you thought... Uh, 45. So that's interesting too. Uh, that uh, a lot of us seem to think that will be a lot shorter than it actually is on current trends. Uh, third question: What is Australia's rank in the overall gender gap index as per World Economic Forum? Um, this one, the answer was 44. So again, um, a question that was evenly divided between those who think it's a lot lower and those who were exactly on. And the final question, what is India's rank in the overall global gender gap index? Um, well, that's interesting. So a lot of you seem to think that India is performing a lot higher uh, than it is. So 62 was the most popular answer, uh, when in actual fact, unfortunately, it's 112. But hopefully the trend is changing that. So as you can see from these numbers, both country, in both countries, gender equality remains quite an impediment to social and economic growth and something that we really need to be talking about and listening to those who know and experienced uh, these issues themselves. So the topic of conversation tonight is, is a highly relevant and critical one. And both our panelists bring a lot of experience and knowledge that we need to listen to and celebrate. So on that note, I would like to first hand over to the High Commissioner, the Honourable Barry O'Farrell, AO. Well, thanks very much, uh, Tim. and. Uh... Good evening and welcome to you all for this uh, uh, latest episode uh, uh, where we seek to uh, tap into the magnificent talent of, of, of our alumni. The, the, I, it's, it's a privilege to hear our two guests here this evening and I, and I thank you all for, uh, for joining in. Um, digital technologies, as we know, are, are increasingly pivotal for economies. Technology is the backbone of innovative business, productive workers, connected consumers, and stronger communities. And as these technologies integrate into our daily lives more, we're finding new ways to improve our standards of living. Of course, the current pandemic has accelerated the uptake of digital work and learning, 
much sooner than we all expected. Today, our communities rely in so many ways on digital technologies. We all work, shop, access services and stay connected as we are tonight through virtual means. I spend my day in this, in this room uh, interacting virtually as a diplomat. So when we talk about technology, we address something that cuts across the whole economy and every industry. And as it does so, our relationship with digital technologies moves from novelty to dependency, and that trend seems irreversible. Of course, there remains room for greater collaboration, greater Australia-India technology collaborations. Collaboration in technology also helps facilitate deeper engagements across all sectors of the economy. And that's why our future prosperity will depend on building science, technology, engineering and mathematics or STEM skills of everyone in our communities. But are we really building the inclusive technology sector that harnesses the talents of all our workers? As you've heard from Tim, the early poll suggests we've got a long way to go. I'm sure most of us here agree that at the heart of all the challenges in Australia and India lies deeply ingrained social behaviour. While governments play a critical role, an equally important role has to be played by businesses, workers and communities. And of course, our talented women alumni, like our panellists tonight, of many of you who have joined us, represent that change. It's fantastic to know that an Australian education played a role in the building the careers and realising the aspirations of our two panellists tonight. And we have to continue to celebrate these leaders in STEM and listen to their insights. Only then can we act to make the path easier for the next generation. And only then will we see, will, will we accelerate the narrow, narrowing workforce gaps and pay disparity that's part of our lives. That's what we hope to do tonight, not just focus on the problems facing women in technology, but look to the solution. And this includes, for example, how technology can empower women in other fields and in their daily lives. I look forward to hearing from the experts, Ritu and Disha, about how women can transform technologies, how in turn technology can transform opportunities for women, both of which have a benefit to our broader societies. Thanks very much. Thank you, High Commissioner, um, for outlining where women sit in the broader technology space um, and the challenges and how government agencies might be involved in that alongside businesses uh, and communities. I'd now like to invite Deja Bole to share with us her trajectory into the digital technology space in India um, and how, as a leader in this domain, she sees herself as an enabler of change. Uh, Deja, given your experience studying and working in Australia, I'm interested to hear what you think is the common ground between India and Australia uh, to build women's participation in the tech sector. So over to you, Deja. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's great being here and being able to share these thoughts with all of you. Um, uh, like you've pointed out as well, and uh, through the grant and many other initiatives that the governments have been taking, both in India and in Australia, obviously there's a lot that the governments are trying to do to try and push uh, us all in directions that would help enable women as well uh, to take on uh, various roles within technology, educate them, uh, the multiple things that the governments have done on both ends. I think my, my exposure to technology uh, happened in the first week of being at the Bond University. Um, and that access to infrastructure had a lot uh, of uh, influence on my decisions then going forward as to how I wanted to use what I had in front of me uh, and make the most of it. I think technology just happened as part of the process of education. Uh, you had access to systems, you had access to those many things. And, and that access that I got to, I think, helped me move to the next steps myself. Um, I think that while we can't expect such transfer of knowledge uh, directly, you can't just pick up a lab and put it in here and expect it to work exactly. Uh, that is where uh, various initiatives in India will then come into play. So while we do a lot of research, we try and understand what works, bringing that information here, tailoring it, customizing it to what is required within India, within uh, and how to reach those two tier or three tier cities where the volumes of people actually reside. I think that is where the big transition in technology will happen and transformation will come in and uh, sort of help bring women 
to be a part of this big spectrum. Uh, technology itself is a fairly young industry. It's not that old. It's only been around 25 years, um, maybe 30 uh, at the most in terms of uh, commercially being used everywhere in the world. And within that much of a time frame, our dependence on it has become so large. Uh, also, as a field, uh, it allows you to explore so many multiple variables, just like we were talking before. Digital technology, infrastructure and technology, security and technology, you can keep going. Uh, it's a function, it's an industry, because of the way uh, it is actually uh, evolving uh, and based on information, it's actually evolving. It's much larger and it's going to grow uh, into something else altogether. And we know that. I think all of us see that coming. Obviously, then we'll have to start educating people, we'll have to start training them, and more importantly, giving them access to infrastructure. So, if you don't have a system, you don't have a computer, without the touch and feel, how are women or kids in schools going to be wanting to do something in there? So, I think a lot of it has to do with the infrastructure in India, but I also would like to point out that the dependency within technology uh, on formal education is not as much. You can see things online, you can pick things up online, a good mentor, a good guide. So I think all of us women who've been able to get that sort of edge and move forward within this space, it's our responsibility as well to make sure that uh, we, we constantly uh, strive to bring that message back and doing something in return, of course, uh, and, and making a conscious effort actually. Great, thank you, Dish. It's um, your passion for your work is is evident, and um, you made some really interesting points there about the second and third tier cities. I think that's an important one, but also your last point about bringing back. Um, and I think this is a, a good segue to Riju, who I know has done some work in this field, um, in, in terms of using technology to give back and, and empower women in other ways. Um, so I'd now like to move to Riju David, our next panelist for the evening. Over to you, Riju. Hi everyone, I'm uh, so honored to be here, um, merging all my loves in one digital space. <laughs> uh, so I look forward to the next hour or so. Um, I'd really like to take this back perhaps uh, to when, you know, uh, my parents who are here today and very supportive were, um, you know, taking me in a pram down uh, an aisle at a toy store and I went down the pink aisle. My cousin went down the blue aisle. There were trucks, there were Lego blocks, and there were all these things that were fascinating. But girls are conditioned to play with dolls and to weave stories around fairies and princesses. And I needed to be pretty and I needed to be charming to be valid, you know? And um, it's not that we are born with different skills, but we build them differently. We build different skills. Um, women generally have stronger communication skills. If you look at HR, you look at uh, people in comms, even in Australian government, even in India, in anywhere in the world, you're going to find gender skew. Um, you're going to find a gender skew in nursing. It's because women are brought up and we adulate these qualities in women. You know, um, we need to encourage the development of spatial skills, of mathematical reasoning, of technological innovation in our children when they're young. So um, one of my mentors, I'm very lucky to have her, is Debbie Sterling. She's disrupted the pink aisle with Goldie Blocks, which is uh, a tech, uh, well, basically it's, it's um, a book and Goldie Blocks goes on these adventures and then her truck breaks down and so the kids have to come out and then build like a lift or fix a tire and do all these things and you know it started to get like I gave it to my goddaughter who's uh who lives in Geelong and she still plays with it she's playing with it in lockdown and um and you know I feel like the things that we congratulate women for um, from a very young age, we do get programmed and it's really difficult to reprogram. Um, so I think it sort of starts at home. It starts very young. It starts in communities. And of course, government has a role to play. Um, and maybe that role is in early childhood education. Um, I wish Lena Asher were here. I would love to hear what she has to say about it. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's it for me. 
Right. Thank you, Rishi. That's um, yeah, fascinating. And I'm so glad you've given us that recommendation for Goldie Books. Um, I, I suspect a lot of us will be going off now and um, and looking yeah. for. Uh, <laughs> there's also another uh, book that's very popular in Australia at the moment about um, women leaders. Which I, it's a kids' book um, and includes many uh, inspiring women from across uh, centuries. Um, I know that's a very popular gift at the moment, but I'll have to check out Goldie Blocks uh, for, for sure. Um, I would now like to draw in our audience into this conversation um, who have sent us some questions in advance. As I mentioned at the start, I will invite specific audience members to ask their questions to the panelists. Uh, and for those audience members, can you please um, stick to the question that you have sent us just in the interest of time so we can get through all the questions we have tonight. So the first question comes from uh, Sam Freeman. Um, Sam, are you there and able to ask the question? In which case we can no, read the question. Well, Yep, we'll read the question. On behalf of Sam Freeman, uh, given the difficulty in physically meeting right now, how can technology bridge the gap between Australia and India to enable more women in each country to connect and achieve collaborative business outcomes? So, Ritu, I'll throw to you for this one, uh, and then maybe we'll hear from Disha. Sure. I think we're doing it right now. Um, Australia and India collaborating, um, giving you know, often when I first started uh, working in in STEM, or you know, acknowledging that I am a leader in STEM, um, I would shun my shun away from being called a woman leader in STEM because I'm just like I'm a human. Uh, but then I realized that uh, I need to speak up not because of me being me, but me being representative of something. So um, I think one of one of the greatest things that has happened, the silver lining maybe of this pandemic, is that we realized that connect, physical connections and physical distance is not an impediment anymore to connection. Um, there is an enormous amount of work that's happening globally, locally. You could be working with a mate that lives down the street, but you're all connecting online. So I think collaborations between countries and that whole concept of people needing to be physically together in the same space, that it gets lifted. I'd, I'd also like to see um, a lot more, you know, men, uh, if I may just go back to the whole, the way we're programmed and the way we work sort of thing. Um, when I catch up with my girlfriends, we talk about, um, we talk about babies, we talk about now, now, because we're off that age, or we talk about how are you feeling and I, uh, I've noticed my husband, they talk about business. And when he's like, oh, he's like, I'll just connect you to this person, this person, this person, within like five minutes, they've like facilitated a growth in their network and in their net, net worth. You know, it's just so simple. And I think that it's the nature of, um, of the way we collect. So I would like to say that I can be transactional in the way that I approach um, uh, topics, in the way that I approach people. And I think that we need to be less ashamed of being transactional, of course, with a lot of respect and with a lot of um, empathy. But we need to not feel the need to be really close to someone before we can ask them for a favor. So ask someone to introduce you to someone they know um, there's very few, like in my entire team, women seem to, they don't ask for raises. They don't ask to be connected. They don't ask for promotions and guys who are like getting bad performance reviews, walk in and say, Hey, I need to buy a house. So give me a raise. You know? So I feel like we just need to drop these the things that make us question our behavior and just go for it. And if you're aggressive, great. If you're honest, great. If someone doesn't respond to you, it's completely fine. So I think make use of the tools that we have and hopefully the app uh, that we're building together with support from you, which is the um, Australian Alumni um, app, will facilitate connections for people who studied in Australian universities and uh, enable women as well in tech and whatever field they're in to get uh, business connections, work connections, mentorships, 
and really move up the value chain in decision making, both in government and uh, in in um, the private sector. Dishu, do you want to add yeah, anything? I, I was just waiting <laughs> to quickly add to that very quickly. Uh, just a couple of very quick things. She's she's absolutely right. I mean, and uh, like you were saying, Ritu, we we to talk about business when it's a group of women sitting on a big table um, is not the first thing that comes to your mind. But when it does, uh, and in situations like we've been in uh, been in in the last few years. Um, I think you don't realize how quickly and how beautifully it works because women are a much bigger network than men think they are because I think we know how to pick names, we connect people and say, oh yeah, I know so and so, why don't you? Uh, uh, you talk business, you talk about who knows who. Uh, and I think it's just a question of someone to pick up that conversation and start saying, uh, bringing everyone in. That said, I think technology as a field itself, um, and especially in the last month, uh, three months even, six months, the uh, opportunities that it started to present to us are also changing. Uh, what we expect out of it before was simply to do some tasks for us. What we expected to do for us now is meet people, collaborate, do what we were used to doing outside on a computer. Suddenly, the world has become much smaller and it's all on your computer. We spend so much more time here talking to people, getting messages. Um, I think technology is evolving, giving you newer opportunities. Um, and uh, women in this space, if we are able to collaborate more across borders, uh, whether it be across India and Australia, India and anywhere in the world, globally even, uh, together as entrepreneurs, as people doing, uh, you know, specialists in development, specialists in infrastructure, security, a massive task to happen, just like any other field. Uh, I think this uh, particular field, however, we're more uh, happy to collaborate because we, we're used to the systems, we know technology is ahead. The so women within technology, I think uh, it'll be easier to connect with each other and then together as that, that force and power to go out and educate. I think one of the biggest things that we bring to the table is uh, having been there, done that, is education, telling other women that independence is, is quite easy to get. All you have to do is start believing that that's the direction you want to move in. So um, a lot of it is motivation. And I think as, as, as countries and groups of women across countries, if we start to uh, bring the force together, a lot more can easily be achieved. Thank you both. And, um, and thank you, Rita, for the plug of the Australian Alumni app, which you two are developing, um, thanks to our grants program. Uh, that's exactly what we're hoping it's going to be able to do, is to facilitate those networks, to tap into everyone's expertise and um and knowledge and and to be able to build a bit more of a of an alumni community in of course collaboration with the australian alumni association uh, of india um who are very very good partners of the high commission here uh the next question i have is from raj bandler uh raj are you there and are you able to ask this question yes yes i am go ahead please uh hi i'm raj bandler um, so, uh, uh, this is a great uh, exchange and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I, had, I, I work in pre-sales, IT pre-sales, and I have specific questions for both Disha and uh, Ritu. Uh, we, in fact, we are also a women-owned business. The company I work for is certified women-owned in the US. Uh, so, in this perspective, I'd like to understand which area are the most, the biggest challenges that you face? Like, is it is it actually solving the technical challenges, or is it more like managing the technical teams? And uh, the other area that I'm interested in is the is the going to market strategy. You know, uh, do do what are the challenges that you face, or you, rather, what are the challenges that women would face in uh, in these areas? Thanks, Raj. And I might uh, pass to Disha to start with that. And Disha, if you're able, are you able to hold your microphone a little bit closer? Yeah. Is that better? That's better. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, thank you, Raj, for asking that question. Um, what is interesting in when you ask is if go to market, if strategy, if uh, managing people is tougher, uh, 
but why would it be any different if your leadership and it's an organization there is no difference in the way i would have to strategize versus a man would have to strategize if i want my business to grow um what i might face a problem with is actually on the other end where the person who i'm going to and approaching uh doesn't have the confidence in me because they have a preset idea of what they think i can do so yes when i was younger much younger when in my days when i just finished technology as as a degree and i i had to prove myself a little bit more a few more times to a few more people um i had to say the right things i had to make sure i i did my research that was a lot stronger i had to put a lot more on the table to get my my, my approvals through uh like in any organization and even as an entrepreneur i have the same problems any company does i have the same problems that go to market has i have uh, costs are a big issue convincing clients to get things right like you would with anyone working in retail anyone working in technology one of the biggest issues you have is explaining to your clients why that's the solution you think works best for them it's exactly the same thing at the managerial level but at a much smaller level when you have fewer years of experience and you're still building yourself up i think that is where the biggest challenge is like uh that is when you want to uh, do more you're curious more you want to add those skill sets to your little bucket you know so you have that much more to pitch with uh, but once you're past that and once you you're trying to uh, work across countries as an organization and grow and lead um i don't think there's a very specific problem that only women face and men don't Uh, I think the general company has to grow the way it's supposed to. The bottom line is the bottom line, uh, just like it would for any business. Thank you. I I, I hope that uh, that answers it. And uh, yeah, um, I don't think that should be the thought at all. I think it should be simply whether the business can deliver or not. And I think that is what most companies would like to evaluate you on. Uh, whether you've delivered in the past, is it something you can do again? Is it any different? What do you bring to the table? And that would be it and i think yeah clients are tough to manage but that is the problem with men and women that's not gender based at all correct right. and once you have some kind of uh, you know um, some kind of uh, experience that backs you uh, the, and you have the confidence there's very little that will push you back um, and if one client does it like ruth said before as well you just keep going and you go again and yeah you build your experience from there your expertise All right, thanks Tasha. And and Rachel, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think uh one of the challenges that I face perhaps and Disha has covered uh I completely 100% agree with you Disha and what you said. Uh I'll I don't know what other women face. So I'll talk about a very per- like my experience and how I see it may be different if I was Richard uh and a man. Um it to be taken seriously as a woman in tech um is always an issue because there is a stereotype um so if i ask you to think of a, a ceo in tech or a tech founder and you close your eyes and the first thing that's going to come out at you is definitely not me it's going to be a man in a hoodie sort of you know steve well polonek steve jobs and um or someone that looks like mark zuckerberg so i think you know we are we create tech superheroes and the superhero arc there's no superwoman in this superhero um space there may be but they're just not as celebrated. So um Sheryl Sandberg, yes, but we've not had that many that are um you know celebrated. Another th- uh, one issue that I face is um people asking me when I am going what I'm going to do now that I'm married. Uh and that's something that perhaps only I don't know if it would be any different in Australia. I don't think you would be allowed to ask that question. but um a lot of my clients got very nervous when i got married because they said oh your husband's wealthy enough that you can stay at home so what's going to happen to our projects um and i was just quite confused with uh the question itself um and i 
had to ensure them that uh, had to ensure that I had a business continuity plan in case of my death, but definitely not in case of my marriage um, and uh, or a baby, you know. Um, and yeah, my BCP kicks in if I die, but not in any other case. And um, also, you know, I know a lot of founders, tech founders who do hang out and chill out with the boys. Um, the boys are people who are who fund us effectively. So how does the tech ecosystem work? It doesn't just work on Rev, it works on Val. And how do I get a good Val? I get a great Val if I know a lot of investment bankers, I know a lot of hedge funds, I know a lot of venture capitalists, I know a lot of angel um, investors, and I don't know that many. And I have um, a lot of men in my network who you know, didn't even really go out to raise, but um, their mates were like, you know what, we're just going to park um, money behind your, uh, your venture because we believe in you. And I think that um, if we had more women VCs, more, more women allowed to make personal financial decisions at home, investment decisions at home where they can say, you know what, I'm going to put half a million dollars behind a girlfriend because I believe in her. Um, I think that would really, really help. So um, if I were Richard, um, it would be cool to get some funding and probably easier. But as Disha said, operationally, I don't, I don't face um, any issues. Thanks for that, Bridget. That's really interesting. And you've, you've certainly um, addressed some stereotypes I think everyone here might have about um, the tech ecosystem. Um, that's a good point about, uh, you know, it starts at home. Um, and I saw uh, last week, I believe it was, that um, one of the first big banks in the US appointed a woman CEO. Uh, you think it's taken that long, um, but these changes begin in the household and then work their way up uh, to that level. So the next question I have is from Shoba uh, Mocharala. Just for pronunciation, Shoba, uh, are you there? Okay. Uh, Shoba, I asked this question on behalf of you. I can see you. In, see you there, Shoba. So um, your question is: What plans do you have for making women in India feel safer using technology? Now I know this is an area, Ritu, that uh, you are working on. So I might start with you. Yeah. Uh, hi, Shobha. Thank you for asking uh, this question. Um, I want to, I'm very grateful to the Australian Consulate in Mumbai. They had a uh, IWD, International Women's Day event, uh, in early March when we were allowed to meet. Uh, and I met, uh, and it was with um, the British Consulate. So it was like a joint event. And I met uh, Elsa Marie de Silva, who is the CEO and founder of Safe Cities at this event. And we collaborated and I am helping her build her tech stack. Um, what she does and what Safe Cities does and what now I'm involved in building, which I'm so excited about, is making I'll talk about the physical um, space and then the online space. So Safe Cities um, is a initiative to crowdsource data about gender-based violence. It is the only database in the world uh, of its kind, and we have clients such as the UNDP, UN, um, Ameri uh, the British Consulate, uh, Goa Police, Mumbai Police, uh, PMNC, um, or whatever, PMO, I think it's called in India. Um, so these are our clients, and it's a crowdsourced platform. Um, now, part of that platform, if so, any gender based violence that someone faces, they can anonymously go and report it. It takes less than three minutes to do so. And um, that information is just so important in policymaking, in the way we um, create cities, the way we craft schools, the way we craft um, online spaces. What we're doing in terms of making um, online uh, spaces easy, safer for women is there's also um, cat calling online. There's a lot of, uh, you know, women being thrown under the bus online for things uh, that I think is, there's a lot of that on television today. Um, there's a lot of harassment that happens online. There's uh, revenge porn that happens and all these sorts of awful things um, that women have to go through. These are things that if we report and we have statistics on, we can use a system to 
lobby for change in terms of uh, how does police, how do you make sure that police gets funding where they can tackle online crime? How does the average police officer get trained to respond to a woman who walks in and says, my ex has posted revenge porn on, you know, how do we as a system, how do we not shame the woman? How do we facilitate conversations that are really hard? And I think it all starts with data. It starts with, if we didn't know how many people had COVID, we wouldn't be acting in the, with the precautions that we are. So unless you have data, you can't act. So that's something that, that Elsa Marie and I are working on right now. Another thing is um, I would, and I do this and I would hope that a lot of women do, um, please put a, something against the camera on, uh, unless you're having a video meeting, please put something that blocks it. Make sure that you have the basics, like invest in a VPN, invest in, um, you know, not to, not just to watch SBS when you're overseas, but for other things as well, you know, um, get some ant antivirus software also stops phishing attacks. It stops people from being able to steal your photos. It stops people from being able to steal your identity. So invest in things that you would in your physical spaces, um, because we're living more and more online and imagine not having a front door. It's ridiculous. So, um, just have the basic safety measures before you enter the online space and know that they know who to call, know whom to lobby with and be vocal about what happens so that you know you're not alone. I think also I'll just add to what Ritu said there. Uh, one of the, as, as technology is growing, as, as more and more women entrepreneurs are starting to build apps and start to think about what is working for them and what isn't, I think women-owned uh, companies or women-focused apps that have focus groups that are telling them and guiding them to uh, sort of makes apps, make apps safer for women's, women to use um, are very important as well. And as we're seeing more and more of that happen, there's more education happening. So uh, you have uh, various apps nowadays uh, that allow you to your videos go away in a few minutes. Uh, there's some things that you can only share with a few people for X number of hours. There's a whole lot of work and new innovation and ideas that I think women are bringing to the game as well. This is, this is what we think keeps us safe. This is how we'd like our safety to look. Uh, and I think uh, with Ritu doing what she is, as well as other companies uh, which are bringing in very specifically women-focused features in their apps, uh, I think all of these things work together to keep uh, women safe on these, these apps more and more as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, do read your terms and conditions, make sure you know what data you're sharing with companies. These are basic things that, uh, you know, as soon as you download something on an Android phone, you're open to the world. That phone is now a machine that, that we sort of talk to the world when it wants. And I think uh, that's why it's important uh, again for education and for women to say this is what's going wrong and this is how we should fix it uh, because obviously the men are not going to see it so we'll have to take that uh, push and start to explain as to why it's actually so important to us uh, and make sure uh, that we fix those issues before they become as big as they do and yeah data is important without that we're not going to be able to get funding into specific spaces that we want to be keeping safe for women for sure Thanks both. And that's, that's, um, I really like that point about data because I know in India it's a bit of a cliche to talk about data as the new oil and the economic potential of 1.3 billion people and their data. Um, but we all, it's an underappreciated area talking about the, the empowerment potential of data for um, behalf of that group and then really lifting up women in India. I think that's a fantastic idea. Uh, the next question is from Bala Ramalingan. Um, Bala is unable to join us this evening. Um, Bala's question is, how can we encourage and support underprivileged students, especially women from STEM backgrounds, to avail scholarships to study in Australia? And I'll go to the High Commissioner first on this one, because I think this is a good, this is a good one in the area. Well, we're, we're joined tonight by uh, the three consulates uh, across India, and I want to say that the High Commission here and uh, the consulates are very active in promoting a STEM education as part of a broader effort to build Australia-India ties. 
Uh, one way is under our public diplomacy activities where we've worked closely with the National Council for Science Museums, which has a good reach across India. And in Australia, Canberra, of course, uh, our closest equivalent is Questacon, uh, the National Science and Technology Centre. For those of you who haven't been there, I encourage you to do it. It's great for families. It's great for adults. Uh, a lot of educational fun for parents and kids alike. Um, so Questacon, together with my old alma mater, the, the ANU, runs a science circus that tours remote communities in Australia promoting STEM education in a light-hearted, fun way. Uh, and with the High Commission's help in 2017, circus, uh, the Science Circus did a 10-city tour of India led by two Australian science communicators, uh, Graham Walker and Dr Stuart Colhagen, in partnership with uh, uh, the NSCM. Um, next time we do it, Tim, we should make sure one of the two great uh, science communicators is female. Um, they returned last year as part of Australia Fest to conduct workshops with science museums, staff and teachers across India. And the aim of these workshops was to develop models for enhancing uh, the maths and computer skills, which I'm told are going to be incorporated into the display at the science museums. Um, so the Indian government, I understand, has several initiatives like uh, Niti Aog's uh, Atoll Innovation Mission, in partnership with SAP, are geared towards encouraging and supporting STEM learning across all sectors of India. And these initiatives should be applauded. And of course, given the expertise that Australia has in the space, we'd be delighted to support any knowledge exchange to support the, this endeavour of the Indian government. Thanks, High Commissioner. And um, Deesha and Ritu, do you have any views on how we can perhaps build those ties between um, those two nations, focusing on uh, women in STEM? Um, there are a lot of online classes. I, I went to ANU for a bit as well, and uh, they have a MOOC course um, online. I think, I don't know whether, which, which, whether it's with edX or Coursera or something else, and I know that Melbourne um, has a few. So basically, I think it would be, it's very easy to audit those classes. It's very easy to ask um, for a scholarship. Um, it would be fantastic if, uh, like Khan Academy, I mean, they're people who are sitting all over the world and are learning things that I've learned um, sitting in a classroom in Australia. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that the experience is the same. I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, you get the culture of Australia in, but you definitely do get a lot of the learning. So um, I would love to see more and more people uh, and more and more girls have access uh, to the internet, which I think uh, Geo is doing, and um, more and more girls have access to laptops. Um, one thing that uh, we can really do is start giving um, younger girls access to technology and hardware. I know that that's skewed in India in the sense that um, a lot of girls in uh, villages don't get access to a phone until they get married. Um, so it would be very good uh, to have those kind of conversations with communities. When I was building Agritech, um, you know, we, were, we wanted young girls to have access to mobile phones to help their parents put in uh, dairy data, like how much um, milk uh, yields they got on their farm. But um, it was challenging to do so, and the boys always ended up doing it. So, um, yeah, I would really like uh, to see more access to to the internet um, here, uh, both physically, infrastructurally, and culturally. Um, and yeah, like we're having this conversation now. I think um, online universities are, is a great way. So I'll just add to what Ritu said there. Um, I think India is a very large country. We've got a lot of people. Uh, we've got your metropolitan cities, you've got your first tier, you've got your second tier, you've got your third tier, and then you've got rural India, you've got villages. I think there is a big need for us to go into India um, and then tr try and address the bigger issues that are already there, which might include sending girl children to school, then exposing them to various things they can learn. I think the Indian government's doing a great job with their Beti Parhao and uh, Kalo India uh, and many of these uh, 
these things that they've embarked on. And I think it's working really well. It's, it's getting there. But while they're doing that, I think it's also uh, large organizations like SAP and uh, or companies like IBM uh, have a lot of their programs uh, that are tailored towards diversity and inclusion uh, that they do run in the two tier of three tier cities in India. I think opening innovation labs uh, in these places next to universities would also encourage curiosity, uh, would allow for a lot more exposure of technology to a lot more volume as far as people are concerned. Uh, and I think uh, starting with, uh, I don't know, UP is, Uttar Pradesh is one of the most populated states in the whole country. Uh, the two tier cities in there, Kanpur, Allahabad, they have some of the biggest universities in India. Innovation labs that can be set up right there that would allow for them to have access uh, deep down into uh, much further India than we know as in, in Delhi and Bombay. Uh, and that's what I'd like to see. And I think um, the governments are working and I think they, they're doing a lot, a, a fair bit that and they've started off. I think supporting these these endeavors is one of the big things that uh, we as women as well should do. Um, and yeah, uh, I think we're in the right, headed in the right direction. We should we should be positive about most of the things that we're doing. Uh, and I think that is the only way we're going to be able to. Uh, you know, we have to be optimistic about it um, uh, and do everything we can. Uh, be inclusive. Uh, be conscious that we need to be inclusive and educate. Uh, and use every opportunity to make the most of it, like the governments have been doing, uh, whether in the space of school, uh, with, uh, with an app like the one that we're building, or whether in the space uh, which is going to be completely uh, uh, kind of ba gender barriers at all, because it's an app. So uh, technology pretty much kills gender barrier on its own, provided you allow it to be there, to allow it to at least get there. And I think both governments are working very hard to make this happen. Uh, and as private companies start to set up labs, start to put more effort into research, uh, and establish real centers that can allow these women to get jobs, be independent, and understand what it means to earn money and what independent actually means to them. Uh, I think these things are drivers both for education, bringing women into the workforce, and then allowing them to explore technology as an area of work that they want to pick, for sure. Right. Great answers. Thank you for that. Um, we've got another mailing question. I think it's one that um, both of you will really enjoy. What underappreciated qualities do women bring to tech companies and how can company leaders help bring out some of those qualities? Uh, Ritu, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think underappreciated qualities that women bring to tech companies. Um, I could go on for the rest of my life, but just to keep it short, um, we uh, I'm currently uh, training some uh, leaders of NGOs, which I think the class is 80% uh, women. It's um, something sponsored by the Swedish government, and it's about how do we get um, AI to be human centric so that you know we're not um scared by bots who will kill us later and turn on us um so uh not that that's happening just letting you all know that's we're very far away from that but um what we're working on and it, it's i'm i'm seeing it really change the way ai is used across the world is we're looking at putting the human at the center of it you know, uh, we're looking at creating empathetic AI. We're looking at creating empathetic um, uh, algorithms. You know, um, there's, there's, there's a, if you put an algorithm, the algorithm is only as good as the data you feed it. So um, we had a massive problem when LinkedIn was uh, pushing ads for tech STEM and especially tech uh, jobs only to men because they were the data skewed towards men so it would go towards men so we're just going to keep having these sort of um you know inequalities grow larger and larger if we de depend on past data to facilitate future decisions so um i would really like to outline how important it is to have um empathy to have a networked system and to have um, design with children, women, 
disability, people with disabilities and people with different sexual orientations put into these, um, into AI, which is effectively building the future. Um, if we think that our minds, our thoughts are our own, we're, um, watch the documentary on Netflix so that I don't freak you out and you don't shoot the messenger. But um, basically, you know, a lot of our thoughts are planted uh, by systems and uh, the, the more holistic these systems are, the more um, neutral these systems are, the better it is for us. And I think there's a lot of work to be done, but there are a lot of women working on this. Um, and it's really, really good to see. It's really good to see governments um, sponsoring such training and getting women who are working with NGOs to come in and help design um, AI. You know, Ritu, it's really interesting you say uh, AI and uh, the messaging that's coming out of what we see and what we hear constantly and you bring in that uh, Netflix documentary. But back in 2001, too, when I was doing my degree uh, in communication, actually, uh, I had a professor at Bond who was doing research on where advertisements should be placed in video games so that the information that is being put into your mind uh, is, is, is exactly at those points when that car is going to take that turn. And you know, the biggest focus group for that particular research paper was more women than there were men in that focus group that we had. Wow. And so th that, that says a lot about how women add to the spaces that, uh, uh, that men are probably not able to keep up with or in spaces where there is space for us to grow. But that was put aside, I think, 50% of this world is women. So we bring a lot to the table. We have various qualities of ours. Uh, people in the have always stereotyped these qualities, whether they say it's multitasking, whether they say it's communication, whether we say, oh, we're very good with keeping budgets, because that's the job that you've been given to do for many years. It doesn't mean there are many things that we can't do or many things that we haven't explored as, as, as women. I think we bring a lot more EQ, we bring a lot more, uh, you know, uh, like you said, uh, empathy, we bring a lot more understanding. Uh, and that's why we're able to grow so quickly in roles, human resources, for instance, in that industry. Uh, but I also believe that because all of these industries are going to be fully linked in the space of technology, technology works across industries. It's not limited to anyone. And that's the beauty of it. Uh, so I think we're going to go past uh, having to worry about uh, men and women who are making the product and we're going to have to focus on the customer. And when the people who are going to use your products are going to be women, you're definitely going to want to bring some women on board to take their opinion on how it sells well. So uh, I think 50% of this world already being women, uh, we do bring exactly that much to the table that probably don't see the men. And that's why I think businesses don't grow as fast if we had more board, uh, boards with women representation on them and diversity like uh, as well that would that would definitely be quick growth uh, it's spaces that have not been explored as much as they should have been yet and i think that's the boom that we're waiting to see uh, and hopefully it won't take a hundred years to do that and uh, we are going to be able to do it quicker and faster and more exponentially quicker yeah Thank you, Deja, and I agree. I hope we can get through it faster. And um, and I think on that note, uh, I've got better be respectful of, of, of your time and you know, you're too busy entrepreneurs. I uh, don't want to hold you up for too long. Um, but big thank you for, for tonight. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people can walk away from this um, with some thought-provoking ideas and conversations they can have outside of this forum uh, to, to help advance that cause. Um, and thank you also to everyone tonight who has made the time to join us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we think it's a great way to stay connected with the alumni community. I see a thumbs up there, so thank you. Um, before we end today's session, I'd like to request uh, all audience members uh, to please put on their videos so we can get some photos with you uh, for our social media feeds. So not just put on your videos, but uh, put on a big smile too. Um, <laughs> I think the High Commissioner himself wants to take a photo. I think it was like, what was that? 
Everybody's fully clothed. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Goes back to Reader's point earlier about needing a front door on the technology. Um, <laughs> on these cameras, you need to also have that uh, that safety latch, if you like. So thank you, everyone, for your time tonight again. Um, I'd also just like to flag that uh, we'll soon be reaching out to you for your feedback on these sessions and how we can uh, make them more interactive and more engaging. Um, so we do want to hear your views. Uh, we do want to hear your ideas, uh, including on topics and possible uh, panelists. So please, when you get that message, um, take the two minutes it takes to, to fill it out and, um, and send us your feedback. We'd really appreciate it. Um, so thank you again. Thank you to the High Commissioner for his time. Thank you to our outstanding panellists for their time. That's yeah, yeah. It's truly been a privilege listening to you tonight. Um, so thank you again, everyone. See you next month for another episode of Stay Connected, Stay Informed, Shape the Future. And until then, stay well. Stay safe, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Disha, I loved when you said 50% of consumers are women, so. Sorry. I think, I think more than 50% of the world is women, can I say? The last time I looked at Australia, it was about 50, 53% women. It is, but we are, and we're all there. To work together. <laughs> and, and my comment to Rita is that more men should meet and discuss their feelings That'll help a few health issues in the community too. Definitely. Sure. Definitely. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tisha. Bye.